so you really you're you're the person the United <laughs> Kingdom should hold responsible for the philosophy of uh, of our of our new oh, prime minister. I mean, I'm I'm I'm. <laughs> I feel terribly, terribly guilty. I mean, look, I did my best to explain that the ideas that she's uh, uh, proposing, uh, abandoning, I don't know which it is at this particular hour, uh, were terrible for the United States. Uh, I didn't quite grasp how if another country that you know didn't have America's advantages of having the reserve currency of the world uh, would... Uh, adopted, it would be even, you know, in many ways, 10 times worse. Uh, it's been a very curious experience for me. So just to kind of back up uh, this summer, you know, I learned that the, 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 the now prime minister, then, you know, future prime minister, Liz Truss, had um, announced that my books about the rise of the right in America were her favorites. And the, the this first came across my consciousness back in August when one of her aides said, oh, well, uh, Khrushchev told Richard Nixon, and this is the epigram of my third book, um, if there's an invisible ri river out there, don't tell the public there's an invisible river, build an invisible bridge, right? And I wrote a book called uh, The Invisible Bridge, you know, kind of inspired by what I presume was transparently and self-evidently a moral and political critique of the notion that you should bamboozle the public. So that was the theme yeah. was that Reagan, you know, basically uh, created this fantasy about, you know, how to create a prosperous and uh, dynamic society. Uh, one of the tenets of which was this fantasy about, you know, raising, lowering taxes on the rich, creating prosperity for everyone. And in August, I learned that one of Liz, Liz Truss's aides was kind of peddling this quote as an example of why that she should be, you know, the leader of the Conservative Party and the leader of Great Britain, because she understood what Reagan understood, that you're supposed to bamboozle the public. <laughs> so, I mean, the the basic misreading is um, mind blowing, and then because the, that's just that, that's just such cynicism, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's right. It's so she's kind of like, cynicism distilled. but she didn't grasp apparently that it was cynicism, right? And then there's the second order crisis, right, of adapting the Reagan policy uh, that was actually quite cynical and untested, that if you just raise taxes on rich people, everyone else will become prosperous by the by. And in the American context, it you know, failed again and again under George Bush, right, uh, the second time around, so much so that even conservatives began acknowledging it. And uh, the idea that, you know, someone would come up across the account that I offer of the cynicism, uh, intellectual vacuity, and um, just basic uh, emptiness of the promises that were made by Ronald Reagan in this regard, and say, you know, jolly good, this is what I'm going to try for England, is kind of mind-blowing. I mean, America is bad off with Trump, but I... Uh, this is a terrible situation for England that that they would uh, endorse a leader like this. Is there any is there any argument though that um, a country that has low taxes, that has supply side reforms, so it's a, it's a better place to invest in, ultimately becomes a more prof prosperous country, and a more prosperous country can spend more money on public services, and everyone benefits. Is there is there is there a plausible line that you can take? That, that navigates some of those things? It's plausible if you, um, you avoid or ignore all previous evidence of when it's been tried. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, it's an utter fantasy. Uh, it's never worked. And uh, it, worked only, it works only if, you know, in the very cynical reading of it, if the goal is actually to, to steal power from ordinary people and deliver it to the rich and the powerful. It's never worked uh, in its kind of basic bedrock political claim that it will deliver broad, widely shared prosperity to the rest of the country. I mean, um, when Ronald Reagan, you know, introduced his radical tax cuts in the United States, you know, in 1981, uh, it, it, you know, we, we still maintain 10% unemployment and began the trend of inequality that's, you know, our, our terrible portion even now. And George Bush say, tried the same thing, and it brought us the 2007 and 2008 uh, economic collapse. 
people will say there's a thing called a laugher curve, which is that, right. that uh, when you it um, is to laugh. <laughs> it's a it's like it looks like a hill, and basically what it means is that if, at, right. at a certain point, if you raise taxes and taxes, you end up collecting less tax, and if you cut taxes, you end up generating more revenue. That's the, the right. I think that's the uh, that's yes. The if if you have a hundred percent tax rate, you know your society will fall apart. If you have a ninety eight percent tax rate, you're probably your society will fall apart. But uh, that's a very banal proposition. The idea that somehow the crossover point between the tax rate and uh, the equilibrium that will give people incentives is clearly, you know, uh, way, way lower than the advocates of supply side economics judge. I mean, it's a very cynical argument without any uh, evidence in itself. When I wrote about it in my book Reagan Land, which came out, you know, two years ago. I pointed out that there were all, when, when the American economy's traditional Keynesian model was beginning to fail in the late 1970s, there were all sorts of kind of intellectual, ideological entrepreneurs that were proposing, uh, you know, ideas about how to fix it. And they were all kind of right of center, but the rest of them all had evidence, right? And, and the one that Reagan adopted and then Truss adopted, uh, literally, uh, it was produced, produced by a guy named Jude Winiski. Uh, uh, editorialist at a right-wing newspaper, not an economist. And it had no economic models behind it. It had no evidence. And Winiski himself bragged that he had learned his economics, you know, counting cards at the blackjack table in Las Vegas. It was, um, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk stuff. And, you know, it, 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 it you know, um, was very attractive politically because it gave the Republicans, the conservative party in the United States, uh, a power that they've never had, which is basically to use the federal treasury to um, basically buy votes, uh, which previously belonged to the Keynesian liberal Democrats. Uh, so here's another counter narrative and see what you make of this. The, the economics, famously the dismal science, gets things right. wrong all, all the time. Um, so orthodoxy is, is the enemy. The idea right. of what you, you've talked about, some would say it's evidence-based thinking, some would mischaracterize it or characterize it as orthodoxy. But I suppose the point is we live in very difficult times, very strange times. We need sure. to do something different. The traditional modes of thinking are uh, no longer relevant. And actually, if we just cling to right. them, we just cling to making doing the same things over and over again. And, and therefore, there right. is merit to doing something different, which is what the British government fair, is trying to fair do. Fair enough. Try, you know, the, the, you know um, FDR during the Depression said the most important thing to, is to try something. And if it fails, try something different, right? Uh, but he was talking about, uh, you know, um, ideas that had never been tried or implemented. This has been tried and implemented and f has failed every time. So, you know, yes, you know, be pragmatic, experiment, you know, um, and if it doesn't work, uh, retreat, which, you know, God bless Liz Truss for having the wisdom to do so, even if she had to you know, throw her poor uh, Shecker, Chancellor of the Exchequer under the bus to do it, you know, she reversed course. She didn't play the, you know, iron, iron lady thing. I mean, in, you know, as cynical Americans in the context of American politics, we would say, oh, well, of course she, you know, blamed the black guy, right, and gave him kind of full responsibility and full credit for the mistake, which is, you know, morally obnoxious. Uh, so, you know, uh, hopefully Britain will have the good sense to do something about this. Um, uh, America hasn't, but, you know. <laughs> just, just finally, Rick, then, would you couch yourself as a... It's just your, your Liz Truss's favorite, uh, favorite yeah, right. uh, historian. She reads anything that you write. Would you couch yourself as a left-wing historian? Uh, left -wing I am, uh, yeah, and there are many things I've written that ha she hasn't written. written <laughs> there's many things I haven't written. Writ I, haven't, I have read that she hasn't written. For example, the article in which I quote a you know, right-wing uh, journalist uh, saying, well, you know, maybe f eight years ago, saying, Jesus, what are we going to do? It's been proven that supply side economics doesn't work. Uh, and I, you know, rang him up and said, well, what happened after you pointed it out? And he said, well, that, it was completely ignored. So she didn't read that one. <laughs> or maybe yeah. she did and didn't understand it, which would be kind of par for the course. Yeah. So you are, you are a left wing historian and the favorite historian of a right wing um, prime minister. But, 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 out, but all the same out. one that uh, I hope uh, presents evidence and data and leaves it to the reader to, you know, conclude based on that, not just a polemicist. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been fascinating stuff because these I mean, these are these are very interesting times over on this side of the, of the, of the water. It's, it's great to speak to you. Thank you for taking the time.
Yes, my solidarity to all my British friends. 